And hi, everybody. It's been a long year, but it's good to see you all again, even if it's virtually. Um, I uh, want to start off by, uh, of course, saying uh, thanks to the um, to you know uh, WAC for hosting this, and I, I look forward to you know doing more conferences, hopefully in person in the future. Uh, these remote things are actually still kind of fun because in this case, what I can do is I can show you our live capture system from within our own dome. Um, and I think that that is something we couldn't do at a normal conference. You know, we could all be at our own domes in some capacity and maybe demonstrate some of the stuff. And so this is presentation is going to be split up into kind of three main topics. That being of kind of introducing a little bit of a live capture system and showing you a little demonstration of it uh, because I didn't know what it was at all. I know some of you have seen some of these things, but I was completely gobsmacked in 2019 when I saw the uh, Charles Hayden Boston Planetarium's live input system. And we immediately had to have it uh, at FISC because we were planning an upgrade. And anyway, the third part will be that actually I'm gonna tag on a little bit to this presentation about a fix to uh, Digital Sky's milk drop. So if any of you have upgraded to Windows 10, uh, I have a solution for that uh, that's been produced here at FISC with my uh, friend, uh, Elizabeth Wild. And so we actually have a little solution for that that I just wanna give you all a link for today. All right, but to start off, let's find my slides. Um, I hope I can make this work. Oh, and you go back to the start. Okay. Share. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Uh, so um, first off, uh, in 2020, FISC had already planned an upgrade to uh, our computers, and that was to include a lot of uh, live input stuff, because we really like to do experimental things. We really like to you know, try to push the boundary of what is live and interactive. So we, we really um, look forward to the LIPS presentations, too, or a conference. Um, and just to give you a sense of what it was that this upgrade entailed, for FISC, we had originally 24 renders and a master and a sound node that ultimately uh, made something like 26 computers. And that was a lot, in my opinion, because that's a lot of uh, things that can go wrong. And then in 2020, we upgraded just six. So you can see that we still have the dilapidated ones there just in case, but we have our six rendering nodes, uh, one for each projector. Um, ultimately, we, have, we need that many because we have an 8K by 8K display. But we also then have our sound computer, we have our master computer. And so that gives us eight computers. And with having so few computers like this, it makes live input actually a possibility for FISC because you have to send the correct signal to every node. And with 26 nodes, it just isn't really feasible. Um, so that was something that I definitely took for granted. We almost did 12 or I guess 14 computers. And I don't know how, uh, how possible live input would have been if we had actually done a dozen nodes. Um, but then we also had this, uh, this really what I feel is a linchpin to all this is another computer, our ninth computer, our capture computer. Um, and I'll sort of break down what some of these are, but I look forward to you guys posting questions in here too, because it's going to get a little bit technical and I just want to share my enthusiasm for how this stuff actually works. Um, so this capture computer then has two video cards in the back that are outputting then the six signals, one for each rendering computer. And uh, well, that means that, uh, there we go, you can see it here, going from one computer in the back of our really messy server rack now, server room. Um, and well, now that this provides us uh, the ability to send a signal from another computer, not just for our main planetarium software, but from another one, we now have two systems. And what do you do with two systems? Well, some of you, of course, have two systems or have even used three. Um, for me, it was like, well, a big revelation of what do I want to do with two systems? And the first thing I did is say, I want to put a planetarium program inside a planetarium program. So if you remember this really old and outdated meme, Yo, dog, I heard you like space visualization, so I put software inside your software so you can visualize space while you visualize space. Maybe some of you will get that, but it's probably, uh, it's probably too old for you. <laughs> um, so uh, what, we were, what we normally did, you know, one of the biggest things that we sort of replaced is Jules Sky 2 had this great GIS. 
Uh, but the thing is, you can only have so much data stored locally because we had our, our whole system cut off on the internet and isolated. But if you uh, instead put on this capture system open space, a lot of you are familiar with Carter Emmerts and American Museum of Natural History's open space program, open space project. It has all of this data streamed to the computers. So now we have a firewall and we accept internet uh, into our computers and we can then stream terabytes of data for you know, Mercury from the messenger data or Venus from the Magellan data, uh, you know, Earth data to exquisite fidelity and of course Mars. And then they have all the other planets and the rest of the universe in there. But for our university classes, they really love, and tourists really love flying over the Earth or Mars, flying through Valles Marineris and seeing this stuff streamed really, really well. So we don't, so we don't just have to have, say, 15 meters per pixel data. We can have, I guess, one meter per pixel data or whatever open space is offering just streamed through our secondary computer. Um, so I would like to do a little demonstration of this. Uh, by, um, I guess, using our theater. Let me go ahead and dim the lights. And I'm gonna pivot this webcam around. Oh, let's see if this works. I'm gonna try to position it right here. All right, so now you're looking at our dome and I'm gonna make it uh, a lot more sensitive to, uh, oh, and let me, stop the screen share. So, so if you just look at the uh, view from my web camera and I'm gonna boost the light and bring down the saturation. There we go. Maybe I can get something out of this. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna try this. Okay, we can see some stars. Beautiful, I can make the stars move. Very nice. Maybe I can be off of the earth in our digital, whoa. I didn't mean to make you all dizzy. <laughs> we can be off the earth in the Digital Sky 2 program. Um, but with our capture computer, yeah, I know it's really grainy and probably hard to see. What I'll do is I'm just gonna click a single button and you'll see how quickly it, it, trans, it uh, transitions over just like this. And now we're, uh, now we're using open space. And so I have all the open space controls available to me and I can transition back and forth. I could make it so it's only half op opacity. And if I had known that this is what we are getting, I would have thought a little bit differently about uh, learning open space a little bit more ahead of time because of course there's a lot of stuff in here. So I think that that is pretty cool. Let's put this back. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, and I'm still over bright. Ah. There we go. Um, so well, another question is, what do you do with uh, you know external devices? So that's kind of what uh, some of our live input systems give us the capability of too. This is, um, since these are two separate systems, it's important to make them separate in mind. One is actually a computer that we can play anything on. We can load up you know, images from, uh, we can load up stuff from the internet. We can display it on the dome on there, other planetarium programs. So you can see ultimately whatever planetarium program you want on our other computer can then with just one license display something onto the entire dome. And I think that is really phenomenal. So I look forward to installing like worldwide telescope. I look forward to, you know, messing around a Stellarium, uh, you know, seeing what, you know, everything, even Celestia, Space Engine, Universe Sandbox, going even further into just, uh, you know, getting Digistar in here and anything we can, I would love to mess around with it. Uh, so we have two planetarium systems in one. It gives us a lot of versatility. And uh, I, you know, I'm curious how some of you might have used this too. If you've seen this in your dome or if you have other ideas yourself. Oh, Nick, can I ask you a question? Yes. Could you make the distinction between it just being a video switch and what you're actually doing? Yeah, so in Digital Sky 2, I'm actually uh, telling it to take the input that is being fed to it from this computer. So this, this one computer is sending, you know, six different signals to six different renderers. And then uh, 
though I just I just tell it in the software to grab that signal and display it as if it is a video or if it's a, a texture. Presumably you could do this outside of Digital Sky 2, but doing it inside of Digital Sky 2 means that I can use all the benefits of Digital Sky 2 for my university classes. The faculty really like that program, as well as all the benefits of flying around the solar system and much higher fidelity with open space. So all I do is I click a, a script that tells it which one to be looking at. And in a matter of seconds, it just switches. And I thought it would be a lot more of a hassle, but it wasn't. So I thought that was cool. Does that answer the question? All right, well, uh, now the next, so that, that was a distinction between the, so, this major computer. And so if you're ever looking to get a live input system, you might be looking more so for this next one, which is how to input external devices that aren't like a standalone computer. Because this one, you know, capture computer we had was very expensive, but maybe you just want to display like a laptop or a cell phone, or maybe the local video game clubs want to come to your dome and play video games on the dome. I don't know what you'd want to do with it. You can even put a webcam on. And so you can then feed the input from any device. In this case, I've got this laptop here, fed through an HDMI cable to this complicated setup. But looking in here, you can see there's the, oops, you can see there's an HDMI input. Actually, we have two. We have some XLR inputs. We have DVI, we have VGA. So there's a lot of different inputs you can get through in this system. And I thought that that was important uh, because we still use a lot of old computers here occasionally, and some people still want to even use um, overhead projectors, so we can't help them there. <laughs> um, and what it does then is it just feeds it straight up onto the dome, and you can barely see in this full dome image my laptop way over there on our stage, and then it's projecting this image of you know this JWST information onto the dome. So I thought that was cool. So this is interesting because it's so far away, uh, that the, this is where the presenter was socially distanced from the rest of the audience. They weren't near me at the console controlling the dome. They wouldn't have to be near the students. They could be at our stage on the other side of our theater. And during COVID, when the university had restricted you know, uh, people inside the planetarium, we could only have 25 people in our planetarium of 200. They could then be socially distanced by being on the other, other side of the theater. And they could be using their PowerPoint presentation onto the dome while I was still doing dome uh, you know, visualizations of the, say, um, special mechanics. Um, and then, of course, we also uh, thought, well, this might be a limitation that if we just have one on the stage, shouldn't we have one near where I'm sitting right now, near this console? And uh, so we have then one that, of course, goes into the other side. And uh, oh, I should give her this red arrow, but we have them on our console, one on our stage, and we have two at the same time projecting on the dome, meaning that I could be projecting something, they could be projecting something. And this has actually been a huge revelation for me, is I can project, say, the Zoom chat on my computer onto the dome, and the faculty or the, presentation, the presenter can present their laptop PowerPoint onto the dome separately. And so we could have you know, multiple different boxes from multiple different devices showing things that are happening live in as big or as small as we want and put them wherever we want. Um, and that's kind of what I was expecting when we upgraded in 2013. I thought this would have been baked into all digital planetariums back then. Um, so that, that, that for me has been kind of a, an interesting thing and I still need to find a, a better way to use it. Um, but we have been using it mostly for maybe there are multiple different uh, people on Zoom who are giving a presentation together. And you want to pin each one of them at full size for the audience who is in the dome at that time. So we have been able to put up three separate presenters in our dome through Zoom, through three separate laptops, then onto three separate places across the dome for the audience to enjoy. And that was... Uh, that was uh, complicated to set up, but definitely fun <laughs> to see. Um, now, of course, you might be wondering, uh, in what ways does it not work? What were we not expecting? Um, well, there's the product and compatibility that I have been really frustrated about that Apple and Roku, and I think even the Amazon Fire Stick all have this thing called HDCP or High Bandwidth Digital Content Protection, AKA they don't let their devices streamed just anything. It has to be validated uh, through, essentially through the device itself. And so the way that we're getting this content onto the dome 
uh, is not HDCP compatible, apparently, only for, say, Android devices, only for PCs. Apple devices are not working unless we send it at a lower definition. Um, well, there's a, um, I was going to say there's an HTCP bypass, but that's probably sort of uh, illegal. It's kind of uh, questionable. So I'm just going to say that sometimes there's a nice thing to have called an HDMI splitter, and you want to get the right kind of HDMI splitter. And so don't look up at HTCP bypass, because you might find a thing that might help you get past the HTCP limitations of Apple. Um, and uh, it's nice to have the ability to maybe feed the second, the second signal from the splitter to a monitor so somebody can watch their presentation like a TED Talk. Uh, finally, some more boring points is that, you know, really long cables, say from, uh, if you need to hide this really big mess of hardware somewhere around the edge of your dome, you then have to get it to plug in somewhere convenient. And so, uh, you have to have long cables that sort of increase the latency. Maybe you need to stretch it too far away that you can't actually get the signal that far. That's kind of a frustration. Um, so you wanna be careful and thoughtful about where you place it. So you might think, what if we just stream the signal from place to place? What if I was just to take, say the Apple uh, information, stream it to you know, a different device and then I could display it on the dome or I could stream say a webcam to my laptop, that might be cool, instead of having to use wires all the time. Well, in that case, you're sort of dealing with lag and latency, depending on your resolution and your frame rate. Um, and so if you're trying to like play a video game or something, it can really get in the way, or if you're playing back a video, it might not be consistent. Um, and so for the last few minutes before I jump into uh, the little milk crop fix, just want to speculate about the future. And the future uh, is something that I, I really want to popularize here, but just haven't had enough time, is I set up our uh, little mannequin skeleton here in front of a green screen, and then had the laptop capture his image and then stream that to another laptop in the dome. And then you can set up a webcam like this one, and people can come up and talk to the, the, uh, you know, the image of someone somewhere else. In our case, they are, you know, this, uh, this skelly man is upstairs and he's hidden away. Nobody sees where he is, but he can still talk to you. And you can talk to him back and forth through the webcam in the dome. You can see his image. He can see you through the webcam. He can talk through the speakers. You can talk to him through the webcam. And so in my eyes, this becomes kind of a, a really interesting way of doing sort of plays or live theater. As you know, we were doing the Voyagers play. Um, if we can just have actually people interact with this presenter wherever they are, and then we can project their image as large as we want, integrated into the dome. That uh, to me is one of the big functionalities that I really like. So I don't have to rely on separate projectors. And uh, that's it for me right now. I was just thinking that this is, uh, this is a good stopping place to, uh, I guess, ask you guys if you've seen, uh, what are some really interesting things you've seen about this uh, used in this way? Um, and uh, I guess I should take some of the questions from River. Um, Nick, they have on River, it says HDCP has messed up many of my plans. This is John Young. It's designed to prevent sharing, pirating. I had to redesign a video system for a conference to only use VGA instead of HDMI. Certainly very frustrating. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, in the future, Apple and Roku just relax those limitations, because we can get it to work on a number of other monitors. Um, but one thought I've heard about is a pass-through, like a monitor pass-through. So if you got the HDMI cable into a monitor that then outputs it to another monitor, then you could probably have it be HDCP validated through the first monitor. Um, this is difficult to do at 2160p. I've seen a lot of people get past it in 1080p um, on the internet, but trying to do it in 4K is, uh, is currently what I'm what I'm frustrated with. So yeah, I sympathize with you, John. VGA doesn't have that, right? It's not digital. And then Ali put in there, this would be a great way to do live talks with scientists around the world. Absolutely. I remember when we had a uh, a special talk uh, a talk with the ISS, you know, astronauts on the International Space Station, and if our and our students would come up and try to talk to them, and we had a really elaborate setup. But in this case, it could be simplified because we could you know, make the image really large on the dome. 
And uh, they could just talk back and forth through the webcam with, of course, a lot of latency because it's the ISS. And then Michelle put in nice way to push the envelope. Now, I, I feel like this is the tip of an iceberg. There has to be an enormous amount more to be done with this. If you've ever been to Disneyland or Disney World and they have a, 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 an attraction there for Monsters Incorporated, the movie. And so they have sort of this, uh, this humorous uh, wall where the monsters will come out and they will be able to talk at you. They can see you through their cameras somehow and you can talk at them and they'll be making fun of you and doing funny things like that. And I was always thinking that that would be a good thing to do with this technology is where you can actually talk to someone anywhere and have no idea how it is that they can hear you. We could hide the microphones, we could hide the camera and you could just say something and they would be able to know that you're talking at them. It's like you're talking to the dome itself at that point. And so when people say, oh, you've got the power of God at your fingertips to fast forward in the future into the past, you could really take that to the next level by, you know, hiding the microphones or the cameras and actually then like having a conversation. Or you could just have some really hilarious comedy skit. I don't know. You could do a haunted house. I've always wanted to turn the planetarium into a haunted house. Um, all right, now for the last little bit, I'm just gonna share uh, this um, milk drop link um, and I'll share it on River and I'll share it in the chat, um, which is that, uh, where is Zoom? Where is Zoom? Uh, if you use Digital Sky 2 on Windows 10, you may have found that certain new versions of it, whenever you scroll in the music visualizer, it lags enormously. Um, so if you want to get past that, we created a little macro that allows you to um, allows you to have a list in a spreadsheet instead of in the, in the milk drop uh, plugin. And then we can just have it be controlled the same way. In fact, it's better in some respects. So if you know anybody who's using Doodle Sky 2 is doing like music visualization and they uh, I've upgraded recently and experiencing this problem, then send them this link. We, uh, you know, we worked really hard to get it working for ourselves and now we're happy to you know, share it with everybody um, to make sure that they can use it too. All right. Um, all right, one last thing I wanted to do just for the, uh, the end of this is to turn my webcam around, turn the lights off one more time. And I wanted to show you yourselves <laughs> projected on the dome with our other laptop. So, yeah, if you want to recursively wave at yourself. <laughs> the next level way that we did, we practiced some of this in, uh, with the Boston <laughs> planetarium one is we got a full dome webcam, a, a full dome, uh, you know, fisheye lens. And then we could project ourselves onto the dome as 40 foot tall people, right? And we could then have it recursively show itself. And it was super amazing. Um, and if you put that webcam outside, you could then, or a fisheye lens on top of your dome outside, you could show a real sky inside your dome. And if people are like, oh, well, it doesn't really look like that outside. Yes, it does. The sky actually does move like that. You could, you could really show them, well, at the beginning of the talk, the sun was over here. At the end of the talk, the sun is over there. It really does move. And we can show you that, you know, one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so anyone who thinks that, oh, this, this stuff is all fake and astronomers don't really know it, they're just, you know, they're just messing around with numbers in a computer. You can show them live the same thing by comparison, side by side. And the planetarium has always tried to keep that light out. But if we let that light in through a fisheye lens, you could really, uh, you could really uh, impress on your audience how, just how real the planetarium is. Awesome, thank you, Nick. Yeah, thanks everybody. Do I look forward to Mark's talk too. Um, someone's just said, or a live telescope feed. Yes, exactly. If you have more ideas, send them our way. I want to hear all of them and try them all out. You know, this is, Hopefully the, the future of planetariums in the next few decades and even just the next few years is to get things to be really live. Do you have uh, uh, access to an EV scope? Those are, those are little, the new little telescopes that uh, kind of automatically put out uh, 
video images or images of what the telescope is seeing. Interesting. They're really nice, nice. Uh, They're nice gaining product. popularity, a little pricey. Well, three thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I wait till the 300 and there's a knockoff version. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, this, uh, this, of course, upgrade was, uh, even though it was costly, it came at a very weird time from COVID, right? We, we're now, as John Keller mentioned, only now just reopening. So we hope to, I think like all of you, really get back to full capacity so we can uh, push the limits with other things like that.